Before we start, I had this idea that, uh, you know, within ICER, we have a lot of extracurricular activities run by students. And one of the very nice activities is that run by the drama club, who have had plays and uh, street plays and theater plays on subjects pertaining to human rights, particularly diversity, disability, and so on. And I'd like to invite at this point Driti and Anshul to come on the stage and just tell you a few words about the activities they've been doing. Because in some way, you know, you're going to hear about the legal aspects. It's also nice to hear about the cultural perspective and the perspective of students. So please. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anshul Kapoor. And I'm Triti. Uh, we are integrated PhD students here. Uh, we've been here for the past four years now. In our journey here at ICER, we have been uh, active members of the drama club. And in the drama club, uh, we have tried in form of art. Uh, we have tried to sensitize the audience here at ICER regarding uh, issues related to human rights. For example, we have tried to put up skits, we have tried to put up street plays on topics like homosexuality, uh, raising sensitivity towards transgenders, ragging, bullying, student-teacher relationship, and so on and so forth. And so far, we've been really fortunate that the audience here at ICER has been very receptive. And the street plays that we have put up, they've sparked discussions, which is already a good point to start that we have such people around who are ready to discuss such issues. Uh, apart from clubs and uh, coffee tables, these discussions have now gone to walls at ICER. So if you go around at uh, near the hostel and parking, you'll see that there are wall paintings there, which uh, recently became part after the competition that was organized. And uh, if you see those paintings, you'll see how students at ICER have depicted uh, human rights violations across the world using their own uh, descriptions of uh, paintings. So now that we find such discussions happening on coffee tables, even at the walls of ICER. We are discussing it. Yes, we are discussing it, but what the population at ICER is not aware about is are the legal implications that revolve around human rights and their violations. And I think Vivek will tell us more about it today and we are very eager to listen from him. We are hopeful this, this lecture will encourage more and more people at ICER to come forward and be part of the formal activities uh, regarding human rights uh, and in general student rights. Okay, so it's been a little tricky for me personally to organize this lecture in the memory of my father because, you know, I work here and I don't want to spend all this time talking about uh, my own family. But I do want to say just a few words which would perhaps indicate to you what were the motivations to organize this in, in his name. Uh, so he was a lawyer. Uh, so he uh, lived from 1918 to 1976. Uh, this year, if he were alive, he would have been 99. Uh, he was a lawyer till 1972 when he became a judge of the Bombay High Court. And he, was, he practiced for four short years before he passed away of a heart attack. Now, just a summary of what he stood for. Uh, he was a strong supporter of rational discourse on social issues, of the rights of individuals, and of the need to uphold and protect the legitimate aspirations of human beings from the pressures of powerful organizations, both public and private. And this is a kind of uh, orientation or approach which he took. Uh, I think it's also interesting to quote from something that his brother, my uncle, wrote about him, uh, he, which is quite amusing also. He thought in straight lines, no corners, no rounding off the edges, no ulterior motive, no desire to flatter or please, no play at all in the joints. A spade was a spade. This, of course, made him unpopular with quite a few. It was thus that those who liked him did so in spite of the bitter pills that he administered and for his deeper qualities. He was intensely emotional and a very great helper. His heart bled for the underdog. He never gave thought to the consequence of doing justice. It would never have occurred to him that the doing of justice should ever be resented or disapproved. Now, it did so happen in his lifetime that the doing of justice uh, was resented to, to some extent. There was a state of emergency in India, and he, uh, his uh, outlook didn't go very well with the government of the day. And the rest is history, which I won't go into. But I think in view of this very single-minded orientation towards the rights of human beings, uh, this lecture series has been initiated in his memory, and I'm hoping it will take place every year around November. Now, I want to add that one of his very good friends at the Bombay High Court was a young lawyer called Anil Divan, uh, who very sadly passed away earlier this year and who is the father of our speaker today, Vivek Divan. And uh, so I, uh, Vivek will tell you more uh, about him and uh, maybe about my father too in the course of his lecture on diverse democracy and human rights. 
but I just want to say that this, the first lecture in this series, I would like to dedicate jointly to PM Mukhi, my father, and Anil Diwan, the father of Vivek. So with that, I welcome Vivek, and I'll give you a brief introduction. You've probably read this. Uh, he's a lawyer who works on the intersections of law, health, and sexuality. And uh, he has worked on issues of HIV, access to justice, LGBT people, law, and human rights, both in India and globally. And he's, one of his important activities has been researching law and drafting or helping to draft legislation. And one thing that we often forget is that you know, the government of our country or any country may appear to present one view on certain issues, but quietly behind the scenes it is working with experts to draft legislation which will actually be beneficial. So for example, legislation on the subject of HIV AIDS has been an ongoing activity in India and it would be wrong to think that any government that we've had in the last 10, 15 years has been in principle opposed or indifferent to it. They have been prodded by activists like Vivek and they have responded and they have got people like him and others to actually work with them and help draft legislation. So I think we should be aware of this positive thing that goes on, which is an ongoing consultancy relationship between experts in law and issues of public health and sexuality. And if you notice, the attitudes of the government of India, again previous as well as this one, have undergone interesting and subtle changes over the years. And I think a lot of credit goes to people like Vivek, to his late father, Anil Diwan, also to his brother, who is a Supreme Court lawyer, Sham Diwan. And uh, with that, I think I would like to welcome Vivek, and we look forward to his talk. Uh, good evening. I hope the microphone's working. And I'm going to, I've been told about, I have about 45 minutes, so I'm going to try and uh, stick to around that much time. I think I should be able to. Um, I'm deeply honored to be here, uh, invited by your prestigious institution to give the first annual PM Mukhi Memorial Lecture on Human Rights, named in honor of Justice Parsaram Mukhi. Uh, Justice Mukhi has a close connection to me, as Sunil just mentioned. Uh, although I don't believe that I uh, actually met him, I, I was much too young. Um, he and his wife, Sarla Mukhi, were friends of my parents. Uh, my father was a lawyer. And his son, Professor Sunil Mukhi, is a good friend of mine. Um, it has been noted that Justice Mukhi's heart bled for the underdog, as Sunil just pointed out in uh, quoting his uncle. But I also learned that he never wavered in his commitment to rendering justice and abiding by the rule of law. He was a highly regarded judge of the Bombay High Court. And from people I spoke to about him, and my uncle being one of them, uh, Ashok Desai, who is a senior counsel in, and former Attorney General of India in the Supreme Court, who is a good friend of Justice Mukhi. Uh, he was a man of great rectitude. This is something that my mother also spoke to me about in her memories of him. He would not bow to political pressures while fulfilling his duties on the bench. And it was this strength of character that was perceived to be disloyal in the time of Indira Gandhi's mid-1970s rule. Justice Mukhi, along with several other judges across the country, were arbitrarily and punitively transferred for passing orders which were not favorable to the government of the day. I think a human rights lecture series in memory of such a rare and sturdy disposition is only befitting. Sunil was generous enough to invite me to give this lecture, he said, because of my work in relation to human rights, and I'm deeply, deeply flattered. Uh, it is interesting. I, I have occasionally described myself as a human rights lawyer, but I really don't see myself as such. And although um, altruism has undoubtedly influenced my tending towards work on human rights, if anything, I have been drawn to such work for somewhat selfish reasons, uh, to a sewage, a part of me that experienced uh, injustice in a strand of my life. And although I'll come to some of this personal aspect later in the talk, this would all would not be really the most useful occasion to uh, ruminate on the motivations that drive one towards um, one's callings in life. Even though I think that is actually a very useful exercise to look back and see what motivated you, why you do what you do. And I also think of all the intrepid people who are actually involved in defending human rights at the, at the ground level, at, at, at the front lines, and I find myself rather less qualified than many. In any event, I'm hum humbled to have the opportunity to speak to a scientific audience on something 
which is a quotidian theme that most of us don't see as such and many of us often find rather distant from our routines. The theme, of course, is human rights, and I thought it would be useful to talk about it today by linking it to a few other notions that have informed my experience and that Justice Mukhi and his generation of jurists and lawyers were born off in the middle of the 20th century. And these are a commitment to democratic values, to diversity, and to the Indian Constitution. But let me begin, and this is how I plan to structure my talk, a little bit about the commonplace uh, but off-mocked notion of human rights. Talk a little bit about its origins and its contents. I don't want to give a, you know, a, a law school lecture kind of thing um, at this point. But I certainly do want to touch on the origins and the contents of it because I think it tells us a little bit about how the discourse around human rights has become what it has. And also to talk about how central it is to civilized society and indeed, therefore, why it is self-evidently vital to the progress of our Indian society, uh, which I think is something we often forget. And especially, I, I think as lawyers, uh, we are trained to obviously um, recall uh, uh, human rights because that's something we're taught. But I think often lay people forget how central human rights are to their very experience of daily life and how vital it is to actually being a free human being. I will focus uh, in the latter part of my talk to my engagement with the issues that I've uh, touched upon in, uh, in, in human rights. So I wouldn't presume to think that you in the audience today do not know the meaning of the phrase human rights. All of us are exposed to and encounter this notion or some form of it at some stage of the formal education system. At school in civics class, I do remember being taught broadly about the constitution, uh, different parts of it, how what is democracy, what is secular, what is this, what is that. And possibly later on in streams of commerce and arts, we are forced to select uh, these streams much too early. And so I don't know if, for instance, when you select the science stream, if you even get the opportunity to delve into uh, issues of human rights at any point. But given how the modern framing of human rights took place, in part as a reaction to this savagery of malevolent minds applying misguided science, and here I refer to Nazi Germany and its attempts to exterminate Jews, homosexuals, communists, Roma, and the atrocities it committed in the name of eugenics, one would hope that in the teaching of science uh, provides insight into the link between human rights and especially the modern and contemporary kind of uh, you know, articulation of this uh, and how it actually germinated post-World War II. Of course, contemporary articulations have their roots in ancient traditions, uh, including in the Babylonian civilizations, the Vedas, in Confucian thought, the Quran, the Bible, uh, and Native American uh, cultures too, which address people's rights and duties. Uh, but closer to present times, and linking more to uh, what we know today as the framework of human rights, were the Magna Carta in England of 1215, the French Declaration, the Rights of Man and Citizens in 1789 after the French Revolution, and the US Constitution and Bill of Rights of 1791, which were templates for modern understandings and framings of uh, what human rights are. You've all heard of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the, the post-World War II foundational document of the United Nations which the global community gave itself as a framework to keep countries and its leaders to their word, to aspire to the highest ideals of human potential with the aim of ensuring that the barbarism revealed by Nazi excesses were not repeated. The hope then was for a dawn of a new era of peace fostered by the empowerment of people to exercise their own will instead of being brainwashed by megalomaniacs prone to drumming up hatred of the other, the diverse, the different. This empowerment required a clear articulation of the rights that people have so that dictatorial tendencies could, have be, could be kept at bay by such protective guarantees and by the vesting of power in not one or a few but the many. Indeed, the end of the horrors of World War II was soon followed by the collapse of colonialism. Many former colonies emerging from the exploitation and oppression of colonization adopted the ideas contained in the international consensus that was reflected by the Universal Declaration. They did so by incorporating human rights locally into their national constitutions. India was one of them, 
Although our constitution was inspired by democratic experiments elsewhere, such as in the United States and France with the French Revolution. We all know that this global world order has, to put it mildly, had its ups and downs. But the fact is also this. A higher proportion of people live in freedom under legal systems that guarantee their liberty, albeit in varying degrees, than ever before. And this is a representation of that from data about where democracy has taken seed in probably imperfect ways, democracy itself being a highly imperfect model, but where actually it has been promised and, and acted out. And it's often there in those contexts where actually people can really contest and claim and, and aspire to human rights in a full way. If you take a look at the Indian constitution, and I don't know how many of you would be familiar with this, I mean, I'm sure you would be familiar with it to the extent that you know that there is an Indian constitution, but really the letter of the law. But um, it particularly has a very lofty language in its preamble and in its uh, fundamental rights chapter. So here's some language. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens. And then you hear these really lofty terms, justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly, this 26th day of November 1949, do hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this Constitution. Quickly, just I haven't obviously uh, kind of given you the, the full language here, but to give you an idea of where we locate human rights at the local level in our constitution. It's in the fundamental rights chapter, part three of the constitution. And here again, I have given you a summary of the clauses there, but they're really uplifting terms. Uh, equality before the law as a right of every person, right, the right to life and liberty and what that entails. And then these freedoms of speech and expression, of movement, of assembly, of association, of occupation, of residence, of conscience, as a law student, and even today, a reading of it gives me goosebumps. And it actually literally gave me goosebumps right now. I find the virtuosity, the largeness of vision, the commitment to nation building by these drafters to be extraordinary. Yet, when one thinks about it a bit, it also states the obvious in its enumeration of fundamental rights. Isn't it obvious, I, I, I would put it, isn't it obvious that as we humans are born and live, we have the rights to these aspects, to speak and express, to movement, to belief, to residence, to occupation, to assemble, to be equal in the eyes of the law, even if not by birth or by circumstance, to have the liberty to decide how we want to live, to life itself, and all that a meaningful life entails, as long as we don't do harm to others. Many of these aspects we take absolutely for granted in our daily goings on. And for those who can't do so, many of these aspects are to be strived for in pursuit of a fulfilling life. Clearly, the framers of the Constitution did not see these rights as obvious at all. Given how colonizers, despots, long institutionalized bias systems around the world and in India had tended to exploit and oppress peoples, they very well knew that although enlightened societies should regard these rights as self-evident, as inherent to human beings, as, as inextricable from human beings, an explicit noting of rights was essential to assure that their abuse is reduced to the extent possible. It would be useful to ponder this for a moment. We often take the most obvious things for granted. Uh, the love of family members, the ability of our physical and mental selves being two examples. And also, but to a different extent, we take our rights for granted. And we don't even see them as rights most of the time. The freedom to commute, to talk and exchange ideas and viewpoints, to choose where we want to live, to dress and appear as per personal choice, to drink clean water, to breathe fresh air, to expect fair and just treatment by others, to non-intrusion into our private homes, into our thoughts, into our relationships. We also know, however, that these are sometimes the very things which are least guaranteed, even if they seem 
intrinsic to being a human. In my experience, this is the case for way too many people, many of whom live in constant fear of all-powerful governments that regiment all aspects of life in an attempt to homogenize human reality, despite those very governments, of course, signing up to international standards and human rights obligations. And many of these people are unable to actualize these rights because access to justice is unavailable. But it's worth asking ourselves, and I pose this because I think I have following debates around um, the contestation of rights, for instance, in a country like India, uh, there was an interesting poll taken about whether uh, democracy was worth it at all in, 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 in modern day India, this messy, messy country that we live in where there's just too much chaos. And, I, and therefore, I certainly think about this and ask ourselves whether it is better to be frustrated in attempts to attain rights that are meant to be ours or to not even have the option to do so, to be completely bereft of any assurance that fundamental aspects of our lives are protected from the force of the state. The contestation to establish rights, which is occurring in the Indian Supreme Court right now, presently, in relation to the Aadhaar scheme, and which has occurred in that court on many other issues, is of this very nature. The Aadhaar scheme and the act which gives it legal authority is voluntary. It says so in the first sentence almost of the act that this is voluntary. It is an expression of the exercise of choice. It is not meant to be an expression of force. If we were a nation where fundamental rights did not exist in the Constitution, then indeed a forced acquiescence to Aadhaar would be legitimate. But we are not that nation. We are a nation that abides by the paramountcy of a free society whose essential aspect is the fundamental rights of its people. If we weren't this nation, there would have been no tools to counter the stain of emergency that wreaked havoc 40 years ago. Fortunately, we are a free people, and that freedom has been robustly upheld by the Supreme Court in conclusively establishing that our right to life and liberty includes the right to privacy. And here I quote from some of the stirring words of the court as recently as two months ago in the judgment of Justice Puttaswamy versus Union of India. This was the case, uh, as you all might know, which received, of course, a lot of media coverage, which actually, uh, where a nine-judge bench of the Supreme Court sat and uh, considered whether there is a right to privacy that we have as Indians. And uh, they, the right to privacy has been, over time, claimed as part of the right to live and, and the right to have liberty. So this is something that has been contested over time before our courts. The government of India, in a very surprising move, actually said, uh, the Attorney General representing the government of India said about uh, eight, nine months ago, that actually there is no such right to privacy at all in India, that it does not exist. And so the court uh, said, okay, let's, let's, let's listen to this now, because there are now very imposing views. And the Aadhaar Act very squarely actually uh, kind of you know, uh, raises these issues. And so the court said, let's consider first of all whether there's a right to privacy. And if there is a right to privacy or not, then we will uh, look at whether the Aadhaar Act itself and the scheme is legitimate. But we need to decide whether there's first of all a right to privacy because the government is making this claim. And then the court held, and this is one paragraph which I thought was uh, amongst so many paragraphs in that judgment, uh, uh, I thought would be, would be important to highlight today. The court said, privacy includes, at its core, the preservation of personal intimacies, the sanctity of family life, marriage, procreation, the home, and sexual orientation. It also connotes a right to be left alone, safeguards individual autonomy, and recognizes the ability of the individual to control vital aspects of life. Personal choices governing a way of life are intrinsic to privacy. It protects heterogeneity and recognizes the plurality and diversity of our culture. It is important to underscore that privacy is not lost or surrendered merely because the individual is in a public space. Privacy attaches to the person since it is an essential facet of the dignity of the human being. I have had the good fortune to work in quite a few parts of the world and interact with a large number of nationalities in the process. 
Although I consider this experience nothing more than a glimpse into these varied realities, I cannot help but come away from these opportunities to be ever more certain that I'm deeply, deeply fortunate to be Indian. It would be utterly disingenuous to not add that this fortune of mine to be Indian is undoubtedly due to being this Indian. I'm upper class, I'm upper caste, I'm Hindu, I'm male. I do exist within a significant marginalization, which I will come to later. But these are markers of my being undeniably uh, giving me a perch from which things seem much rosier than for others. Yet I also know that this experiment of a gigantic, free, phenomenally diverse, and colorful yet cumbersome society, which is India, is something to be treasured and to be in awe of. To be sure, I probably, like many of you, complain and crib about aspects of this very same roiling entity regularly. But I've also seen how far more homogenous, smaller, and unfree contexts oppress and clamp down, and how larger but completely regimented societies are forced to conform and be controlled. Human rights are at best abstract notions in these environments. Yet in complex and complicated India, if not realized by all, they are at least available to be contested and claimed. I'm going to move on to now my personal engagement with uh, human rights a bit. And actually the rest of my talk is probably going to focus on these two, three areas. Uh, but I should say that I have no pearls of wisdom to share here today. I don't have the intellectual heft or the uh, analytical skills uh, or clarity to do so. But I do have a particular life experience that has been offbeat in many ways from a mainstream. Um, I, I think all of us have our different experiences. I find mine has been a particularly uh, interesting one. And so I'm really here to share that with you in the context of this talk. Um, it's an experience that has given me some exposure to the diversity of human experience and the use of democratic means and values in seeking and claiming one's human rights. This experience is related to issues that rarely ever get airtime, except in their own little world. So when Sulian asked me to speak, I thought it would be salutary to share some of this experience with you, and not least because there is a relationship of my experience, in some ways actually, to pure science. Um, I speak of a tragedy that was all around us, albeit not patently visible, in the 1990s and early 2000s in India and had begun to cause much suffering and the death and death in the 1980s in other parts of the world. It is science that has contained this tragedy today. But it is not science alone that has done so. To put it more accurately and to reveal a far lesser known fact, it has been science with human rights that essentially curbed what was an unrelenting epidemic. And I speak, of course, of HIV and AIDS. When the scourge of HIV came to be known and finally understood in the early 1980s, when young Caucasian men in cities in the United States who were otherwise perfectly well were debilitated by cancers like Kaposi sarcoma and other opportunistic diseases due to the rapid decline of their immune systems, the immediate and logical response was of going to the medical realm and the laboratory to understand what the problem was. After all, it was clearly a disease spreading rapidly in an otherwise virile population. The response to it would be most obviously then found in medical science. Way too many people, several lakhs of them, died before science was able to get to the bottom of what was ailing these men. Meanwhile, political will was utterly absent in mounting the resources and public health focus that was required to set up systems for prevention, care, treatment related to HIV and AIDS. As some of you might know, it was actually initially not called HIV or AIDS, it was called GRID, GRID, which was gay-related immunodeficiency because a lot of the young men I'm referred to were homosexuals in big cities in the US and in Western countries generally. It took a community in strife to collectivize and demand their health rights. And that is when policymakers and the medical the science community and politicians couldn't help but take notice. One of the great organizations that came into being in these times and still does critical work with affected communities is ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. That's what ACT UP stands for, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. 
It's, to me, its full name symbolizes just the sort of energy and passion that came to characterize the response to HIV, a human rights-based response that pushed policy and science to do the right things. And here are a couple of pictures uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, this is New York City, 1980s. People were being, you see a poster, housing for people. People were actually being denied residence in buildings. Uh, people were, of course, thrown out of jobs, refused treatment in hospitals. Uh, and in that process, actually, a wonderful uh, nonprofit opened up in New York, which still does amazing work called Housing Works. And Housing Works opened up just to ensure that people with HIV in the city could actually live in safe, uh, un not under threat, not in the streets, not left behind. And then, of course, you had ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And you can see uh, posters here of people demanding clean needles for drug users, uh, demanding treatment, etc. But things like this um, make me shudder to think what if AIDS had first spread its tentacles in a totalitarian system? Would we ever have known that it existed before it was much, much too late? Because it first spread exponentially in an open society, the openness allowed many people affected to demand attention and services through advocacy, help of the media, and protest when their pleas fell on deaf ears. Here's another example of protest. This is, again, 1980s. Uh, the government has blood on its hands. One AIDS death every half hour. So this was, again, at a time when uh, Ronald Reagan was in power in the United States. And because this was associated with gay men, largely, he didn't want to touch this. And so he never spoke about this disease for five years. He didn't even make a public statement about it. And certainly, no monies went into actually um, trying to solve this. this. This became really a people's movement. Of course, even in open societies, there are haves and have nots. And because HIV was a virus whose trajectory was deeply influenced by social determinants of health, aspects like gender, aspects like other marginalization, sexuality, etc., women of color in the US, for instance, who also bore the brunt of the epidemic, never got the visibility and attention that white gay men did. Obviously, autocratic nations are not and have not been immune to HIV. Do we know, rather, and I pose this question to you, because it's, it's, it's amazing how no one talks about this. Do we know today that amongst the worst localized epidemics is within people who use drugs in Russia, which is an exponential epidemic that's taking place over the last half a decade? And no one is talking about it, and certainly not that government. I recently was told by someone who actually works with communities, University of Seattle, who works uh, who's, uh, with the university there, and works with communities in India and in China. Uh, they have a partnership with the government, both governments. Uh, and he told me just last week that there is a crisis in the making among men who have sex with men in China. Because all the money for, so China, has reached a point where now it believes that it doesn't need foreign aid to deal with its uh, developmental issues. And so a lot of the money has been pulled away uh, from the Global Fund. There's something called the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, which you might have heard of. Uh, and China doesn't need the Global Fund's money anymore. And that was the money which was going in to assist at, in this vast country to assist community groups and communities of gay men to actually try and see that they were able to access information, services, commodities to prevent HIV and to, uh, and to actually treat it. Uh, but there is, this friend tells me, a crisis in the making among men who have sex with men in China. Governments there will do everything to suppress these facts, but while the data is clear, people affected are powerless to demand rational, evidence-based public health and human rights responses. Fortunately, India is a free and open society. And when HIV began to be taken seriously here, a response took shape that was much more than simply a public health response. Initially and quite naturally, there was panic and a tendency to isolate and to quarantine. Our first legal response reflected this. In the late 1980s, Goa introduced law that mandated isolation of anyone who's tested HIV positive, thinking that this restriction of rights would be the best way to curb the spread of HIV. The understanding only later emerged and was accepted over time with much education, advocacy, and civil society persuasion that the promotion of rights was the best way to actually tackle HIV. Although HIV is a medical condition, 
what it has revealed since its onset is that a biomedical response focused solely on providing people with the commodities and medicines to prevent or treat the virus is inadequate in dealing with its control. An effective response to control HIV, we have learned, requires understanding and recognition that structural factors, social and economic marginalization, for instance, contribute to HIV vulnerability. And that societies need to develop abilities and demonstrate political will to reduce the impact of these factors to actually effectively control the epidemic. HIV is often found to reside in parts of society that are the most marginalized or have been traditionally shunned. People who use drugs, sex workers, transgender people, men who have sex with men. Today, this is where India's epidemic unfortunately continues to fester. Much of this marginalization has been cemented in the social fabric over several generations. So where does human rights come in then? Well, the law often contributes to reinforcing this marginalization by criminalizing those who are already social outcasts and pushing them even further to the margins and denying them equal rights to people it, that the law views through a moral lens, which often reflects majoritarian or colonial or uninformed prejudice. Yet, we have learned that the law can also play a vital role in driving positive, inclusive social change and attitudes by reflecting evidence and rights-based principles. By protecting the human rights of marginalized people, it can reduce their inhibition to access social resources, protections, opportunities, health, education, employment, housing, etc. Such an enabling approach which rejects punishment and supports empowerment can contribute to social transformation by giving the traditionally dispossessed an array of tools through access to information services and justice that allow them to protect themselves and others from vulnerability to HIV. An anti-rights approach in relation to HIV only exacerbates the marginalization by making targets of the law fearful of accessing the vital services required to mitigate the effects of the epidemic. As has been pointed out by a leading expert, uh, the most important public health lesson emerging from the HIV epidemic is this, that the protection of the human rights of persons at risk is the most effective way of arresting or slowing the spread of the virus. To illustrate this, imagine a law like the one I just mentioned in Goa. It mandates that if you test HIV positive, your status is mandatorily to be notified to the authorities and you are to be isolated. I don't know if y'all are, most of you are much younger, but uh, some of us might have seen a movie called My Brother Nikhil uh, 10 years ago. It's based on the first case that my NGO fought uh, related to this Goa law when Dominic D'Souza, who was a pioneering um, AIDS activist in India, um, uh, was arrested under this law. So this law, coming back to my illustration, the law mandates that if you test positive, your status is mandatorily to be notified to authorities and you are to be isolated. This, of course, impugns the right to confidentiality, which is a right we have. Yet, the government can argue that all rights have limits, and which is a legitimate argument, especially when their exercise can cause harm to other people. Therefore, the breach of confidentiality, according to the government, then would be that isolation is justified and breaches of confidentiality is absolutely fine. But then imagine what message such a law sends to society. Essentially, it will drive people away from seeking testing and vital health information. And an epidemic which is already stealthy will become even more so. So if I know that a law exists which forces me to actually uh, be um, notified to authorities and then isolated, I'd rather just never test myself. And if I don't test myself, the epidemic will go underground. And if it goes underground, it disappears and we can't control it. So the logic and the public health rationale then of this is that you have to empower people, not disable people. If you really want to get the epidemic under control and to actually be able to deal with it. Um, and so a law like this would actually make it impossible to control the epidemic unless everyone is forcibly tested, which again is a violation of autonomy and consent rights, but apart from that, it's completely impractical. And public health goals will therefore be compromised. Now imagine that the testing services that in this Goa law, for instance, are voluntary and confidential, but can be denied to people on the whims and prejudice of the healthcare worker. So for instance, if a hijra wishes to be tested for HIV in a private laboratory, but is denied the same by a hostile and phobic healthcare provider, she has no recourse against such discrimination 
because the private sector is not covered by the constitutional guarantee of equality that I had mentioned earlier. And her health-seeking baby is discouraged by a health system which should actually be encouraging her to come into the system, test herself, get the information, protect herself, protect her sexual partner, etc. Um, in both these situations, the situation of mandatory uh, notification and isolation and the situation of uh, discrimination in the, in the health workplace, uh, the guarantee of human rights to confidential and non-discrimination play a critical role in upholding what are fundamental rights but also achieving public health aims. So when we talk about human rights in the context of HIV, we are upholding rights per se but we are fundamentally also strengthening a public health response. And this is something which has taken years and years and years for people to get their heads around, especially policymakers, because policymakers are worried about, uh, first of all, morality, and they're politicians who are worried about their vote bank. And so taking decisions to support unpopular segments of society are necess not necessarily easily done. This then is the possibly counterintuitive but real and effective way in which human rights can contribute to effectively tackling HIV. This paradox, the protection of rights actually being the way in which you control uh, the spread of HIV and not by isolating people. Now, my work in HIV has given me the opportunity to engage with people and context that expose me to worlds that I would never have had the opportunity to see and witness lived realities that are hidden, difficult, yet full of fortitude and hope. I wonder how many of you have heard of the stellar work that has been done in parts of India within some of its brothels to prevent the spread of HIV. It is work based on human rights and the empowerment of sex workers, particularly in Sonagachi in Calcutta and Sangli in Maharashtra. The empowerment by and of sex workers which married public health and human rights has resulted in extraordinary benefits to the communities and to the public at large. So let me tell you a little bit about that because I think these are things which really are not uh, should be actually, um, you know, real examples for the world and for us to learn from, but are, are re really discussed within small circles. Sex work is effectively criminalized in India under overarching anti-trafficking law. Yet rights-based efforts to empower sex workers despite the looming threat of criminal law has borne great fruit. In Kolkata, an HIV and sexually transmitted infec uh, infection project was introduced in Sonagachi brothel in 1992. This provided treatment, information, education on sexual health and HIV and condom promotion through a participatory peer-oriented approach by empowering women in the brothel to actually be able to negotiate with their clients, strengthening their resolve, strengthening their collectivization. Very encouraging results have been witnessed over time through the efforts of the Sex Worker Coll Collective and the name of it is the Darbar Mahila Samanway Committee, DMSC. And it has an associated with it, the USHA cooperative. Condom used showed sharp increases, almost 89 to 97%, along with the significant re reduction, therefore, in HIV and sexually transmitted infections. Self-regulatory boards were set up by the sex workers in the brothel. And they were set up by Darbar and to ensure that minors were not getting into the brothel. And you saw a reduction in minors in the brothel from 25% to 2% while the median age of women in sex work increased from 22 to 28 years. The USHA cooperative was set up for sex workers to provide financial support in difficult moments. The cooperative, cooperative acts like an institution, a financial institution, collecting deposits from sex workers, providing basic banking, running a microcredit program for them, and creating job alternatives for retired sex workers. Although this extraordinary work has yielded immense benefits for the communities in Sonagachi, it has occurred in an environment which criminalizes the, the law, which the broader law still foists criminal, criminalization on these women's lives. But I think you would agree that such an effort would not have been possible where there was an utter absence of human rights, a situation that many sex workers find themselves in across the world, and I have worked with many of these sex workers across the world. Let me speak a bit about the place of criminal law for a moment for it is this approach by the law that has been deployed against those most vulnerable to HIV to make them even more susceptible and marginalized. So look at this slide. I, I don't know if the, the line of the script is clear, but basically it's a graph which shows 
that in countries where uh, the HIV rates in countries where uh, male to male sexual behavior is criminal and in countries where it is not. You just see the rates. The red is where the criminalized, uh, where uh, blue is where it's actually not. And this is comparing not apples and oranges, but comparing African Caribbean countries to African and Caribbean countries. In India, sex workers are criminal under the Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act. Drug users are criminal under the Narcotics, Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act. And men who have sex with men are tra and transgender people are criminal under Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. For those of us who have worked in the area of HIV, it is clear as black and white that although human trafficking is an evil that needs to be stopped, as does the sale and distribution of drugs or non-consensual sex between any two people, these laws are misguided in their emphasis and understandings. As the expert Global Commission on HIV and the law pointed out in its report in 2012, bad laws often make moral judgments by dividing people into criminals and victims, sinful and innocent. These laws are often based on outdated notions of behavior and culpability. Indeed, what these laws do in effect is to ensure that the women in sex work and the user of drugs face the brunt of police action and violence, instead of focusing on bringing the trafficker of humans or narcotics to account. They do nothing to address the underlying reasons that perpetuate trafficking. I had the benefit of interacting with the civil hospital in Surat, uh, which was providing HIV services to brothel-based sex workers there over a decade ago. The findings of this intervention over time were very clear. Every time that a police raid occurred on the brothel, sex workers were rounded up and put in lockup to satisfy the quota, arrest quota of the police. And every time this occurred, HIV and health work in the brothel was completely disrupted, whereas during a routine day, health-seeking behavior, including ensuring of condom use by clients, was clearly on the rise. And obviously, when a sex worker's health is looked after, her client's health is looked after, and if her client's health is looked after, general public health is looked after. Uh, part of my work uh, at the NGO I ran was to sensitize and build the capacity of key actors involved in the HIV epidemic. This included uh, sensitizing the judiciary, the police, uh, hospitals, doctors, NGOs, affected communities, trade unions, etc. I recall this moment vividly in 2003 when we co-organized a meeting with inspectors and sub-inspectors of South Mumbai uh, on these issues. The director of my NGO was one of the main speakers. The turnout was superb. We had 50 of the top cops in South Mumbai present in the room. A very difficult thing to do. The aim was to speak to these law enforcers on how criminal law was having a gravely problematic uh, health impact on socially marginalized communities, sex workers, transgender people, etc. Uh, this is obviously difficult, controversial, highly sensitive terrain. My boss began to speak. The audience was completely in attention, and I was sitting amongst them. At some point, when the talk got to the nefarious section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, the inspector sitting next to me whispered in Marathi in my ear, and he said the following. He said that this law is utterly pointless and silly. He said that in as much as it is related to consensual activity between adults, it should be completely scrapped. But he also said that because it is on the books, as law enforcers, they are obliged to recognize and respect it. And that in this room, we were sitting in opposite Azad Mehdan in Mumbai, he knew at least a handful of his peers who were homosexual. I have heard this said about the deployment of criminal law against sex work and drug users too, that people who enforce these laws see little effect in curbing the actual evil that the laws are supposed to prevent. Now I will speak, so this was broadly about some of these communities. I will tell you a little bit, I've, I'm already about 38 minutes down, so I'm gonna extend this by a few five, five minutes or so if that's possible. Um, I want to speak about something which is actually closer to a relation, has a closer relation to pure science than most of what I have already said. Uh, and it is another extraordinary way in which human rights played a role in advancing the benefits of science and which I have had the good fortune of witnessing. I refer to the challenges, and I don't know how many of you are aware of this, this battle too, but uh, the challenges to patents and global intellectual property systems in relation to medicines that was, has put into question the validity of applying such monopoly rights like patents on health and pharmaceutical contexts. And underlying this work has been the conviction that the right to health must supersede the right to make profits, um, which really is not a right. 
I, of course, refer to, and many of you, I, I imagine many of you as scientists are probably aware of a lot of this stuff around patenting, etc. But the fact is that India had this really progressive, 1970, one of, the good, one of the few good things Indira Gandhi probably did was she introduced a patent law which actually protected local manufacture by only recognizing process patenting. Therefore, the product was not recognized, uh, a patent on a final product was not recognized, and so if you change the process, multiple people could make the final product, which of course created competition, and competition lowered prices, and lowered prices meant people had access to various things, particularly medication. So India was really uh, the supplier of affordable medicines in the developing world, and continues to be in large part, but uh, at one time certainly it was absolutely um, very much the breadbasket for medicines. But then we had to subscribe to an international regime which was by 2005 sign up to TRIPS, what is known as the Trade Related Intellectual Property System and the World Trade Organization. And there we had to recognize product patenting, which meant then that if you have to recognize the patent in the final product, then whatever process you make it by, you cannot make that final product. And which led to, of course, monopolization of who could make those uh, products and who couldn't, and ended up largely being a multinational pharmaceuticals who actually um, uh, held patents in many of these regards and actually set the prices which were really inaccessible to most people and even people in the West actually. So the game change happened again in the context of HIV because HIV was, uh, antiretrovirals were coming, develop, uh, you know, improvements in them were coming, some marginal improvements, sometimes significant improvements, etc. And so it was CIPLA really who lowered, who changed the game. Um, this is a broad graph to show you just how prices collapsed. 2001 onwards, uh, and AIDS really became, from a death sentence, HIV became a chronic illness. And this is the sort of collapse, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars rather, a year in costs. Uh, you're seeing Brazil actually issue a compulsory license uh, way early, I'm not getting into the technical stuff. Uh, and then genetics became available, and, G and Brazil refused to recognize uh, uh, the patents of American, uh, American and European pharma companies. And then CIPLA said, we can do this for nothing. And that was a game changer. It just completely changed, uh, you know, it just completely changed uh, this, this disease, this thing which was definitely a death sentence. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've gone to hospital wards where I've seen death around me and I've gone six years later and I've seen only life. It's been a remarkable thing and it's because there was a counter, there was a, there was a human rights argument made around access to medicines. I should say that uh, this, this, this battle actually, um, this is, I, I even remember this little pamphlet that we made in multiple languages in 2005, this is the point when our law inevitably had to change. We had no choice but to change it. But what we could do was put protective measures in place to see that at least to some extent our law can be, uh, uh, our law is as friendly as possible of, to our manufacturers. And so you saw an AIDS movement which just went out on the streets, protested, and even protested actually at one point, um, and not just one point, at many points, the granting of patents subsequent to 2005. We were able to demonstrate in litigation before the Patent Office, before the Supreme Court, that what was being claimed by Novartis or GlaxoSmithKline or other companies as inventive, as something deserving, as an invention which deserved to be given a monopoly right was not really an invention. It was a minor step which was well known in the industry and therefore was nothing which was actually exceptional and so did not deserve another 20 years monopoly. Uh, what is known as evergreening in the industry. Uh, anyway, I'm not getting into the details of this, but I th it, it was an extremely powerful moment. Uh, you see these protests. Uh, you see this. This is not related necessarily. This is actually not related to HIV. This is uh, Novartis' um, attempts to sell this medicine called Gleevec, which was for chronic myeloid leukemia, for 14,000, uh, 14 lakh rupees. $14,000. I'm, I'm, I'm not clear now about the price but a huge amount of money, impossible for almost anyone, and Indian Pharma was able to manufacture it for 7,000 rupees a month, which is still expensive, but like no comparison. 
and we were able to prove in the Supreme Court that this was a completely false claim. So here's, here's human rights and actually the claim of the right to health working to make access to medicines available for many people. Now I'm going to actually touch on something that I, um, that is another theme of this talk, which is about diversity. And I think I've talked to you already without really saying it about the diverse ways in which uh, people live, people live realities are. And, but I, I want to talk particularly about uh, one aspect of diversity, which is a personal story also, and which, is, uh, which I think is hopefully kind of going to make you think. I, have, um, I would like to dwell a little bit more on diversity by speaking about the personal, like I said, and the political, and the overlapping of the two at times. I'm an openly queer man, and without wanting to get stuck on terminology today, I will use the, use, use the commonly used word gay, since it probably lends itself to more clarity. Most of you probably are more familiar with that than the word queer, and I'm happy to discuss queer later. I have mentioned Section 377 a couple of times in the past half hour, and you may be familiar with the law, given how widely it has been covered by the media over the last 15 odd years. Uh, this has occurred largely because of a public interest case that was filed by the NGO I worked at, Lawyers Collective, HIV AIDS Unit, in 2001, seeking the striking down of the law because it violated the fundamental rights of adults of the same sex who were involved in consensual sexual conduct. What does Section 377 say? Unnatural offenses. Whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman, or animal shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment of either term, etc., etc. Penetration is sufficient to constitute carnal intercourse necessary to the offense described in this section. As you may know, as, and, and many of you know, uh, the NAS case, as it came to be known, has been through a roller coaster ride. While it was thrown out on procedural grounds by the Delhi High Court in 2004, it was later reinstated there by the Supreme Court. The Delhi High Court passed an internationally and nationally celebrated judgment in 2009, liberating millions of us from an archaic colonial vestige. I mean, just look at the archaicness of this section. If you just read the language, it, for me, it's laughable, actually, at this point. And, and, you know, this comes from the Indian Penal Code, which is one of the most beautifully drafted laws possible. I mean, it's genius, some of it. Uh, the section 299-300, which is about culpable homicide and murder. Uh, Lord Macaulay, who drafted this, drafted that, and he was a genius there, but he was obviously a, a deeply a moral person here. Anyway, it was uh, archaic and colonial vestige, which was dismissed by the Delhi High Court, and thereafter, in a show of much too rare solidarity, multiple religious forces, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, challenged this ruling and appeal in the Supreme Court. And in what I can only term as an utter betrayal of justice, the Apex Court recriminalized queer people in 2013. And you saw, uh, and you know, this is, this is one photograph. I mean, there was, a, there was a movement on the streets. I used to live in New York in those days. But I, I know that um, over time, uh, uh, we were able to really captivate the imagination of public at large around this issue. And so people came out on the streets to protest. This recriminalization by the Supreme Court was the first ever that I know of in international jurisprudence. Millions were cast as potential criminals all over again, and from what has been gathered, blackmail by the police has resumed, ostracization within families has revived, and crucial HIV work again happens in very challenging contexts. As you may recall, for instance, soon after the perverse ruling of 2013, a wife in Bangalore who had been snooping on her husband registered a case against him under Section 377 after recording his liaisons with another man. This sort of deception happens for many reasons. One reason is the entrenched unacceptability of sexuality diversity within our society. There are, other, there are terms to call it uh, intolerance, homophobia, etc. Another is um, you know, the, the roles we play, what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, etc. And consequently, this has led to so much self-hatred among many people uh, with non-normative sexualities, whether they feel same-sex attraction or not, or confusion in their minds, and therefore actually choosing contexts in which to get married and hide their sexuality, etc. And I'd say a, last, a vast majority of men who have sex with men in India are probably married. Um, to women. 
the fact though is, is that all societies have diverse sexualities and sexual orientations. And also gay people are diverse in all kinds of ways. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that and I'll try and wrap up in the next five minutes. Take me for example. My difference may not be apparent. I pass as a heterosexual all the time to my annoyance now most of the time. And I fail to pick, tick the boxes of many a gay stereotype. I'm, for instance, not effeminate, I'm not flamboyant. Uh, being this way, therefore, I end up not being subject to abuse when walking the streets uh, from knowing at the end of the day, uh, knowing that at the end of the day, because I can pass as a person that I am, I can contemplate occupying social spaces that would be out of the question for uh, masculine women, transgender persons, effeminate men, and women generally. So that's me. But then there is Daksha Ben, and I wanted to tell you about two people who I have met in my life, and I think I'll, I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. Uh, there is Daksha Ben. Uh, to tell you about her, I have to go back 10 years to my desk at Lawyers Collective, where I worked in Mumbai. We focused on providing legal aid and undertaking advocacy on HIV-related issues, etc. We used to have queer people walking into the office, people living with HIV, sex workers, transgender people, etc. And we had cramped quarters in the heart of Mumbai's financial district in Flora Fountain, where the entrance and the exit spilt right onto the road, bustling with chaiwalas, photocopy shops, stationers, Irani restaurant, etc. I oversaw operations of the organization and supervised staff there. One of the staff was Daksha Ben, who cleaned the office during opening hours for the past decade. She was middle-aged, a mother of grown-up children. That morning, she told me in Gujarati, Saeb Tamejara Bahar Auso, will you just come out with me for a bit? I assumed that she'd had some conflict with another staff member which needed a resolution. And the way things were resolved in our office was that we had to stand on the street and actually resolve things because there was really no place and privacy in the little tiny office that we had. Um, I stepped out with her. And as soon as I did, and to my astonishment, she introduced me with a clear thrill and coyness to a person saying that she'd like me to meet Mara Mitra, her friend. The friend was a large, safari suit-clad, manly woman with a crew cut, a tempo driver by profession, and clearly the current love of Daksha Ben's life. I think of this moment often. It was one of the most satisfying among many that I had on that job. Having seen the goings-on in office, Daksha Ben had found comfort and probably validation in sharing this deeply private and deeply tender aspect of her life with me. We came from universes, universes so acutely separated by class, but we had this wonderful commonality that she knew and I discovered that day, our queerness, our difference. She was telling me that we had ties that bound us, albeit intangible. To me, she was also making a statement, probably unconsciously or subconsciously, that this is who she was in relation to larger society. Finally, let me share another anecdote with you. It is 2003, and I'm sitting at my desk in the same NGO, but in another prior tiny office. Stella, who's the administrative officer, peeks into my corner of the room, uh, my corner of our quarters, and says there's someone at the entrance who appears rather agitated. I expect it to be one of our clients who is angry with the way the case is stretching out in the courts while their health is rapidly deteriorating due to HIV or AIDS. Instead, it's a visitor from out of town. He is exasperated because he's spent the last 36 hours walking around the area, finding it impossible almost to locate our office. He got a hold of our address from a little Marathi leaflet that we produced to inform people about knowing their rights about informed consent, about confidentiality, about non-discrimination. The leaflet has been produced, has proved immensely popular and got wide circulation through the vast network of urban and rural NGOs that we are engaged with. Translated into uh, eight language, at least eight languages, it can be tucked into one's pocket or purse. It talks about HIV and about people at the margins who are impacted by it, men who have sex with men, sex workers, etc. Our contact information is provided to answer any queries readers may have by phone or in person. And so here he is, upset that he's been unable to find the office, but as it turns out, also about something else. He's a handsome, lean, short young man with often expressive, open expressive eyes. But there's a worry and a sadness there, and it's patent. He's dressed in a Pathani suit, full beard, and prayer cap. He spends the first couple of minutes expressing the cause of his agita agitation and the need to speak to someone in person, a phone call not being satisfactory. 
I help him calm down with words and a glass of water and sit him across from my desk to inquire what he is here for. He goes around in circles explaining that he found the leaflet in the public hospital he visited for a checkup. He realized that here were a group of lawyers who could advise him on a situation that he'd been encountering and wanted to have do something about. He was educated about HIV, he knew the spread of it, he knew that unprotected sexual intercourse and other behaviors could, could make you vulnerable, etc. He knew about the prevailing stigmas around it. After this preface of several minutes, I prod him toward getting down to the brass tacks, although by now I have a sneaky feeling of where this is leading. He's been making eye contact until now. But that stops on my interjection, and I figure he needs a lot more time. So I step back and let significant silence intercede. I recall what it felt like being somewhat in his shoes just 13 years prior, during which time he shuffles around self-consciously in his chair. He intersperses the silent awkwardness with the revelations about his background. He comes from afar, small town Maharashtra, quite a distance from Mumbai, the son of a Malvi, training to take over his father's mantle and already playing the role of the Muezzin in his town. But that, he also is what he is. Main jaisa hu, waisa hu. And he really can't go on much further. He shrivels up in the chair, his eyes downcast, his arms folded up to his body representing a degree of excruciating disempowerment and discomfort that is familiar and unjust. I give it a bit more time and intervene, and I take a gamble. Our conversation is in Hindi, and I tell him, maybe aapke jaisa hoon. I'm also like you. That takes him utterly by surprise. He immediately looks up at me and then hurriedly back down. He asks me what I mean, and I say, what do you think I mean? Realization begins to dawn, and the eyes gradually begin to rise. Yet no eye, or eye contact is made. And I say it, maybe some langik hu. I'm homosexual too. And that, although our circumstances may be very different, I've gone through the same questioning and that your torment sounds familiar to me. He hasn't met anyone who self-identifies as homosexual, he tells me later in the conversation, much like I hadn't until nine years prior. He is stupefied to meet someone who does, he also tells me later. And in the next 10 minutes, like a balloon that's been pumped with air, rises up in his chair, hesitantly at first, but when we get to exchanging our views further about how our attraction toward other men comes so naturally and is so intrinsic to our very being, about when we began to figure this out in ourselves, about how indeed we constantly dealt with shame and guilt, and my saying that the journey toward pride is a long but worthwhile one. He sits upright, broad-chested, looks me in the eye, fundamentally and so evidently relieved, thrilled, at peace somehow, that he's met a brother of sorts, an understander, someone he is able to finally speak to. He re remains unable to call himself homosexual, some language, uh, in the time that we continue to talk. I'm like that and therefore. But he reveals the conflict he has on a daily basis with his faith the reconciliation he yearns for in that part of him, which I'm unable to help him with being agnostic atheist myself, and his predicament with which I'm, so una I'm also unable to help him with, but at least can provide some clarity on. His predicament is this. His daily routine requires him to walk a couple of kilometers from home to the mosque early in the morning, a walk, I might add, that has a sway and a lilt to it, a swish, which is the stereotype for homosexual men in some quarters, that path takes him along a main thoroughfare with several mechanics shops. Ever since he can recall, he's heard pejoratives like Gandu and Chakka, faggot, eunuch, being hurled at him loudly across the road by the mechanics who look up from their work, seeking to vent their retarded masculinity at him. It makes him want to disappear. When he comes home, comes across the leaflet, he realizes that as a citizen of India, he is vested with fundamental rights. And surely this hateful conduct can be countered with those very rights. He's traveled overnight to Mumbai, spent a day and a half looking for this organization, determined to know what can be done to end this harassment. And I venture to think in the hope that he can finally actually share with someone the fact that he has always experienced the urge and love that dare not speak its name. I have nothing to offer him by way of legal recourse neither a realistic solution through the law, nor a local lawyer who can be available to him more readily in case things get even more dangerous. What can an effeminate man do if he is being teased and bullied for just being who he is? 
In educational institutions, there may be some possibility of redress, however unlikely. But in everyday life, there is nothing. Not especially when one is criminalized by the very legal system that one seeks redress through. We talk about some other issues related to our sexual orientation, support group systems that exist in Maharashtra that he could keep reach out to if he ever felt the need, how in bigger cities in India, organizing, collectivization, and socializing were increasingly happening despite a shameful criminal law. He leaves the office that day a couple of hours after arriving. He has received no solutions to his predicament, but when he leaves, he does so a visibly different person. Surer of himself, knowing that he wasn't entirely alone, aware that there would be more people to listen to him, with little more joy in his heart and peace in his mind. I've never been in touch with him since. I hope he's doing well. He reminded me that day that lawyering was not just about arguing in the courts or working in law firms. Sometimes, and pleasurably, it involved helping someone along in understanding their wonderful selves and also their fundamental human rights. Thank you. This is probably the most moving talk I've ever heard since I came to ISER or indeed before that. Thank you, Vivek. This was really amazing. Uh, it was wonderful to cover the gamut from the legal aspects uh, to the human aspects of human rights. And uh, we'll now, uh, although I think everybody is a little uh, <coughs> is, or, or highly moved by what we've heard, I think let's open it for questions and discussion. We still have a little bit of time. So if there are any questions. That was a spectacular talk and it dealt with a lot of different things and I was wondering if I could ask you about just one of them amongst the many things. Uh, in particular, I was wondering about the patent issues that you raised and uh, about essential medicines um, in the context of HIV antiretrovirals. What my question was really about why you think maybe both possibly from a legal and political perspective, it was so imperative for the representative government of India to sign on to those uh, what appeared to be almost anti-people mm. aspects of the World Trade Organization's rules, given that in my understanding, and this may be my misunderstanding, that uh, there are international laws and there are national laws and the, they may not necessarily overlap due to just simply jurisdiction and so how do you see this and where do you see this going in future maybe? Uh, okay. Um, so, so, you know, I think, it, I think it's important to kind of remember also the point at which all this happened, which was really the early 90s. And so we, were, we had opened up our economy. We were a country which had massive debt. Uh, we were in major crisis. This was uh, pre Narsama Rao's time. So it was uh, that time when uh, we were still a socialist, secular republic, etc. And uh, there was really, um, uh, we weren't the sort of, even anywhere near the sort of economic powerhouse that uh, we certainly think we are today. I think my understanding is that. Uh, and from what I've heard people speak who were part of negotiations at that time, they really didn't know what they were signing up for. I, I don't think the implications of what this meant were understood. I think there was actually a huge signing up that took place across the community of nations. So it wasn't even like there was a conversation amongst the developing world that is this in our interests or not. So there was no, I, I don't think there was some kind of a grouping which said we'll resist. I don't think people had thought of the pharmaceutical aspect of it at all. So, you know, this is a regime which covers anything. The pharmaceutical aspect is a particular aspect which actually a lot of countries leave out of, of patent protection. So, you know, what Indira Gandhi did was not particularly off the wall in those days. Uh, and it's something that even Western countries have done over time. And I think the implications of just signing on the dotted line and not really reading, th I, th I think that's where I think uh, uh, generally that, uh, that, that that happened. Uh, I remember studying this because I was in law school and there's this thing called GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, it was called, which then became TRIPS and WTO and all that stuff. Now, where will this go is a really interesting question. I, I uh, again, I'm, I think things are moving so rapidly that it's hard to say, but there, is two, there are two or three things happening. One is that, um, China is entering, China signed up to WTO and China took a long time to sign up to WTO. 
And China has decided that it is going to start manufacturing locally. What China actually used to do was send a lot of its raw material to India, and we used to produce the generic. That is also something that China is now thinking of doing from within its borders. So we're not even going to get the raw material. And so I, in terms of India being the breadbasket, it's a really questionable thing about where the raw material is likely to come from. Uh, China itself is going to probably, uh, I don't know how much R&D it actually does. And I think that's the other thing which, uh, if those of you interested in this, need to realize that a claim that is made on monopoly and patents is that we are the inventors and so we need this monopoly to gain back all the money we put in to actually make that invention. Whereas it's demonstrated, it's in reports of US government reports, forget about anything which is more neutral than that. Uh, that uh, actually investment comes in uni at universities. It doesn't come at GlaxoSmithKline or, 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 or Merck or Novartis. That's one. The second is that they collect back their profits in no time. It probably sometimes in these blockbuster drugs in a year. So I mean, you know, there's the, this, the, the excuse that we need 20 years to regain all our profits is absurd. Um, I think also though that, uh, we're going to see now more and more people living with HIV move. I didn't show you that slide, actually, I don't have it here. But uh, more and more pe people move in HIV from first line treatment to second line to third line. And third line is what falls within your post-2005 uh, new medication, the new generation antiretrovirals. And those are very, very costly. So I imagine that more and more people move there, the more and more governments are going to say, well, you're going to have to either com issue a compulsory license or something like that to manufacture locally. Or, and issuing compulsory license is not an easy thing under TRIPS. It is available, but I think it's been exercised seven times in 10 years or something, or 12 years. So you can imagine how difficult it is for smaller countries to actually do this. So I, I, I'm, you know, I can't give you a clear answer, but from people I know who are actually much more engaged with this at this time, there's a sense of uh, cynicism around what may be possible and may not. Actually, if I can add a little comment and a question to that, you know, at the time this WTO trips was <clears throat> being hotly debated, uh, there was a comment I read in uh, the foreign media from, from Britain, I think, uh, of a person who had studied this drug, this generics issue, patenting and generics, and was commenting that the difference between Brazil and India in how they approached the WTO obligations was very notable, namely, you have WTO obligations, you sign it, but then Brazil would go on doing whatever they felt was good for their citizens until, you know, some court WTO really yanked them up and said, no, you can't. Then they would say sorry, but they would have five years or ten years to do something for their citizens and provide cheap drugs. And the criticism made was that India was not looking out for its citizens. It was just bowing down to the WTO, WTO thing and not trying to you know, go sideways, which Brazil was doing. Do you, do you know about this? No, I think you're right. And I think actually what precipitated the AIDS program, the government of India to actually provide a free uh, drugs program in India, finally in 2004, was what was happening in Brazil. Uh -huh. And it's a lot of us activists here who said, well, first of all, Brazil is pushing, it's issuing compulsory license. I think it issued one or two key compulsory licenses then. And it's manufacturing locally and it's saying we're going to give it through our national health program, which they actually had a very, they had a very good national health program. And, and Bra Brazil did a budget exercise. They said if we spend $200 million now, we're going to save $1 billion in costs, in hospitalization, death, infirmity, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, they had done a proper analysis of what the cost benefit of this. India certainly didn't. But I think this sort of pressure. So, for instance, Cipla, Hetero, a lot of the generics here also were had lowered the costs and were supplying it to African countries. So that was another pressure point for in the Indian government. Patients here were like, "Well, our companies are sending it there. Brazil is showing you the way, and you're you're sitting uh, doing nothing here." So that's what also pushed some of this stuff uh, here, for sure. Because I, I can tell you for sure that I don't think the government of India then or generally cares very much whether people living with HIV die or live. I mean, I don't think this comes from some great sense of empathy and, you know, because there's a lot of moral judgment made around HIV that if you've got it, you deserve it probably for some sinful reasons. Yeah. So why don't people think that something like AIDS is global? So people will travel from country to country and spread it unless there's medication and it's controlled everywhere. 
So at least those things should be made affordable for everyone, right? So why, why don't you know, people all over the world decide that these are global epidemics and we have to control them anyway? <laughs> Well, I, that's a, that's a, I, you know, there's a global commitment under the United Nations kind of treaties, etc., for to deal with it. But there are ma massive interests at play. You're talking about trillion-dollar industry. Uh, it's it's not going to be easy to actually. Uh, I don't think it's going to be easy to counter some of that. Actually, you know, a lot of that is so. It's an interesting question around. And one way of answering that is to say that um, the activists in South Africa filed a case, uh, the Treatment Action Campaign, which is one of the great campaigns mo of modern times, which is the AIDS treatment campaign, filed a case against 35 pharmaceuticals in uh, the court there uh, in 2001, again, because they were, the prices were ridiculous, their right to health claims that they made, and there were intellectual property issues involved. This is 99, sorry, 99, 2000. Uh, it came to be known that a lot of those 35 companies were bankrolling the political campaign of Al Gore for president. So he put pressure, he tried to put pressure on Mandela to see that this case actually fell. So, you know, there's a lot of complex stuff at play. I mean, one way of answering that is to say that actually it's almost impossible to get a international consensus on this because, um, you know, the powers are, Manifold and and it's difficult to really. Um, there's also a, there's a, there's also a sense that uh, like I said uh, just now that uh, you know um, people with HIV don't necessarily deserve the sort of attention that they get and that HIV itself doesn't deserve the attention it gets because you know how did you get this disease you must have done something wrong so you know then you have to so I think some of it comes from that notion of uh, not wanting to commit. Hello, sir. Uh, thank you for the eye-opening talk. My name is Reema Jamal. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about the, uh, how, when, how these rights work when uh, taken together. So for example, uh, uh, in Islam, a woman cannot travel without a male guardian, which has to be her brother, her husband, or her father. And uh, uh, this law is very much ex exercised <laughs> and used by uh, Muslim men within their households. So, as a Muslim woman in that house, uh, how do I make, how do I access these laws? And uh, if, if, if I do, how does the right to religion uh, came, uh, come into this? And how does this intersection play out? And what can I expect if I, in fact, take my father to court over this? Okay, uh, so this is obviously a very vexed question in the Indian context, particularly because some time ago the Supreme Court said that as far as personal law issues are concerned, it would not venture in, it, it, you know, personal laws are allowed to kind of do their own thing. So for instance, if there are customary laws and the customary practices that become, a, in a sense, personal law in those communities, then they should be allowed to happen. So therefore the whole discussion around triple talaq, et cetera, comes from that place. And actually, it's a pretty radical thing that the Supreme Court has intervened and said that this is a practice which we are going to actually uh, set aside. So it's very, very, very uh, careful balance because the idea is to kind of allow for pluralism, allow for you know personal identity to flourish, etc. Whereas also the, the the constitutional kind of protections are paramount. In my, if you ask me personally, I, I do believe that. The, for me, the Constitution is paramount. I think it has to trump any of this other stuff. Um, and therefore, uh, for a freedom of movement issue is a simple freedom of movement issue for me. I don't think that anything actually can come in the way of that. But um, how do you tackle that? How do you challenge it? I think you actually, you know, it's a writ process. You go through a writ petition to one of the constitutional courts, the High Court or the Supreme Court, and actually challenge this practice. Uh, how will it be received? How will it? How can you take your father or your husband, etc.? Is much more complicated. I would, wouldn't be even able to begin to figure that out uh, in this manner. But um, I think um, that's what your remedy would be to, to challenge that. And I think success. I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, the courts in India. I mean, on triple talaq, I think they have taken this step. I'm not sure if they would take this step in every regard. Um, so, very difficult to, 
but it's a it's a troubling yeah it's it's a, I, I you know it's a conflict of laws kind of thing whereas you have this system and you have the constitution and what should prevail and what shouldn't sir i am shomodip sure i want to ask about a particular law it is armed force special power act yes and it is direct it is not a direct violation of human rights the afsp uh, so can you just expand on that question a bit how do you say it's a viol why do you say it's a violation because uh, there is a uh, article 21 in indian constitution the right, right to life right so in that act the police forces have the power to shoot anybody right so it's not a violation of article 21 and human rights right so you know all so you're asking me for my personal opinion i think it is but if you're asking me for a legal uh, what would be the legal basis on which to argue this I think one could argue that there is a conflict there and that the Article 21 right supersedes anything inferior, the Constitution is above everything else. Uh, the response to that would, could be that every right has restrictions and every, no rights are absolute. So, you know, with rights come responsibilities, etc. So, everything. I can't, for instance, free sp freedom of speech cannot be just freedom of speech because there are things like defamation and things like sedition, etc., etc., which limit what you can say and you can't just say anything you feel like. Obscenity, for instance, is a freedom of speech, a curbing of the freedom of speech. So, for instance, like that, there could be just, government could say that this is a justifiable reason to actually control people's lives because this is being enforced in places where there's volatility, where there's massive insurgency, etc., etc. Now, it's for the courts to actually say whether this is valid or not. If you're asking me as a judge, I would dismiss F AFSPA completely, but this is the way in which it would be argued. And so, there, so you know, so even in HIV, for instance, uh, you know, protecting the confidentiality of a person's HIV status. So supposing I'm married to a lady and I don't tell her I'm HIV positive, but I, and I continue to have sex with her without a condom. Is there a duty of the health of the doctor to inform her and breach my confidentiality? Yes. If the doctor's assessment is that actually there's a, there's, a, there's a harm being caused to a third person, then sure the doctor has to intervene. Uh, so you know, always there is an exception to the rule, but that exception has to be exceptionally implemented or enforced, you know, it's, it can't, cannot become the rule. Um, uh, hello, yeah, uh, thank you for an excellent talk, very candid and very moving as uh, so said. So I just have two questions. The first one is about the section, uh, Article 377. Uh, what do you think is the future of that? I mean, do you think it will, I mean, we have seen so many flip-flops in the last few years yeah. at the Supreme Court, High Court and all. So what do you think, will, will we see the article go away? And the second is a personal question, uh, uh, since you openly mentioned that, uh, uh, we hear about this term called coming out. So in your personal experience, what difficulties did you face, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, dealing with family, friends? Uh, in your, uh, when, when you decided to come out eventually. Thank you. So um, on 377, uh, I am very optimistic all of a sudden. I'm generally a pessimist. Actually, I was one of the lawyers who filed the case. And I think three or four years down the road, I remember, you know, friends asking me, so what's happening? What's, where's the case? Nothing's happening. How many years will it take, etc.? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I'm very, very negative. And then suddenly 2009, we won. And I never expected it. Uh, and 2013, I never expected to lose and we lost. So if I say that we'll win this time, then we'll lose. So I don't want to say that we'll win. But, uh, so you know, the privacy judgment is remarkable. For some reason, Justice Chandrachud spent at least four pages on Section 377. And he said it's the worst thing that's possibly happened in the last few years. Basically, in short, that's what he said in this court. So he was essentially, that judgment was telling us, come back to the court, we'll fix it for you. That's really what the court said, in, if you read between the lines a little bit. And I think that's the consensus view of all lawyers involved in the case. So the move now is that we are going to reignite the case in the court, but we're just looking at time because uh, this has to be heard by five judges. The new Chief Justice, who is the Chief Justice who, you know, the National Anthem Chief Justice, he, <laughs> so he, he, it's in his hands to actually give us a date, etc. Now one doesn't know what his response to the, some of these things is. But uh, we don't think that we can keep on waiting. So I think chances are that by early next year, we will approach the court, the parties who are affected, and say that we would like a date fixed, we would like a bench fixed, let's finish it off. Because what's happening now is, for instance, Aadhaar is going to be heard by five judges. 
Uh, next month, I believe Babri Masjid is going to be heard by five judges. So they're finishing off all their five judges' cases. So we are also planning to... Now, you know, this is... Uh, what we realized is that this is like uh, Russian roulette, uh, the Supreme Court sometimes. So, you know, which five judges? Who will he put, who will he not put? What attitudes? Because clearly personal views come in the picture. Uh, you know, the, the, if you see the 2013 judgment, it's, it's entirely prejudiced as far as I'm concerned. It's got nothing to do with the law. Almost entirely nothing to do with the law. If you apply the law, I think we have a very strong case. So that's the thing, you know, I think we have to figure out that. But I think uh, we'll definitely be moving in the next few months. Uh, hopefully by next year we'll have some one way or the other. And I think people, uh, some of us uh, who've been involved for a long time are also fed up. We're like, you know, we can't keep on waiting. Now you just tell, call us a criminal once and for all or don't. Then we'll figure out our lives. But this 15, 17 years of suspense is also, and also, you know, you have to look at, uh, I mean, you don't have to look at, but the world is also going in a certain way. And it, especially uh, progressive, democratic nations are going in a certain way. So does India want to be that kind of a place or it doesn't is also another question. So I think, and I also feel, for instance, that this government has said officially, the RSS has said officially, that they do not believe in criminal law. They, they think it's all disgusting and deviant, but, and it's probably a disease also, but it's no need for criminal law. So, you know, we might even have that in our favor. And that's good enough for us. I mean, I think at this point we wouldn't be bothered, but we, we, we don't want to be criminals anymore. Then we'll see how, uh, how to, uh, about personal, um, you know, I, I'm not a very typical example because I've had the most incredible experience. Uh, I came out to my mother and siblings at the age of 20, my father five years later, thinking that he would be very, very, I wasn't sure how he'd react. He was extraordinary. As a matter of fact, he's appeared in the case. He's written about uh, him being a gay father in the press. He's written, he's, he's written about how this law is absurd. Um, it's been an incredible, incredible uh, response, uh, you know, experience. Uh, not a single friend I have who has been uncomfortable. So, you know, I think in many ways very fortunate, but not a typical experience at all. I think uh, most of my people I know have, there are challenges. And I still think, even today, I mean, I think that, I don't think my heterosexual parents understand my life. They understand my siblings and their heteronormative ways. They don't understand my ways. But that's all right. I'm not at a point where they need to understand everything about me. Uh, that, that they completely and totally support me and accept me. I have a partner of two years now. We live together. It's interesting to live in that, to live, to negotiate. For instance, I'm not from Delhi. I live there now. But as a gay couple, to negotiate this living together. You know, it's so anyway, it's, I don't want to get into too much. Uh, detail about this, but it's in, it's a very different uh, experience. It's I, I find it a, a different experience. I don't know how people interpret us, uh, but it's fine. Uh, so far, no violence. <laughs> Hi, sir. Uh, you talked about this Aadhaar thing. Like, uh, is it actually compulsory? You told it's free to society, but our government is making sure that we yeah. get Aadhaar, yeah. as in. They are disconnecting our mobile phones if we don't have Aadhaar. They are not allowing us to get a bank account. So is it the hypocrisy of the government or...? No, I think it's mind-blowing actually. I think uh, it's, it's actually so clearly said in the Act. If you read the Act, it's a voluntary scheme. The word voluntary is used. It cannot be compulsory. So to say bank accounts, mobile phones, there's something new now, uh, what was it? Uh, some other th linkage of some other document. A driving license has to be uh, linked. Everything has to be linked. Uh, and it has to be done by such a certain date. So what is happening, I think, in the court now is that the lawyers against Aadhaar have gone and said that, you know, we better finish this case off because otherwise these dates are coming up. It seems that the government has said we'll push back the dates. But I don't even understand how they can enforce these things if it's a voluntary scheme. So. I think we'll know about this uh, by the new year also. And I have a feeling that we are going to have Aadhaar, whether we like it or not. And we're going to have to link everything to it. That's my feeling. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, do I have the right to like choose my religion or any local, uh, uh, like some, some personal community kind of thing? Yes. Then uh, what about uh, her question? 
I mean, she has the right to follow that personal law or not, right? She does. It then can't she argue it that way? Yes. So that's another. So you know, I think you can always argue that I have the right to my beliefs and I want to follow those beliefs. And if they're not forced on you, and you know, no one's going to really stop you from doing that. I think your question was a little different, though, right? That if what if I have a problem with that, that system, then what can I do to? Uh, but you know, if you if you have if you if you believe in a certain way of thinking, etc., I don't. Th I think you have a freedom of conscience and religion. So my question about the uh, you said that given a case. Two, two different benches decided maybe in an opposite way, right? Which case? Like, like give, given one case, two benches, uh, two judge bench can def, uh, decide in a like uh, opposite way, right? Uh, so is it that our law is uh, not really good enough? Uh, why is it giving personal choices of the judge? And how is it to be protected from personal choices? Right, so I think you're talking about 377? Yeah, say for example, that right. is one. But so 377. Uh, Generally, he is asking that how can two different judges have opposite opinions on the same? So you are you were saying that uh, maybe this judge will look at this case favorably, that judge won't. How is the legal system? How can it allow such a? It shouldn't. And as so so the uh, to to respond to that, um, what we've done in this uh, 377 case is we've gone back to the Supreme Court in what is known as a curative. Uh, petition. The security petition has been used like four times. Actually, it's been used often, but it's been only allowed four times. It's a very novel thing. It's only in the last 10 years that actually this idea of curing something which is obviously not proper has been. So we are going in that and we are going in that to show to the court that those two judges actually made errors. Now, we can allege bias, but we can never prove bias. I can never tell, say that actually he doesn't like gay people. How am I ever going to do that? So, you know, bias is not worth it then. So what you've got to show then is that there was a wrong understanding of law. And the wrong understanding of law needs to be corrected in the curative petition. So that is what we are now do, trying to do, to tell the court that two judges said this. Now you better put it before five judges because this thing needs to be corrected. The people opposing us will say, no, 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 there's nothing to correct. It's a perfectly fine judgment. Then it's up to the five judges to decide how and what. To your larger point, of course, the courts have to go by the Constitution and the law, not by personal views, which is why, it, it, which is why this 2013 judgment was also criticized so much. Because, you know, if the judgment was based on law, then you could not criticize it much. They have a legal argument. They placed it. We've lost. But here it's all about, oh, there are very few of these people. So because there are very few of these people, you go to parliament. Um, that's not law. That's just some random observation. And it is not our job to do these things. It's the parliament's job to change law. That's absolute nonsense. It's the job of the judiciary to strike down laws which parliament passes, which go against our rights. That's, the, that's how you do checks and balances in a democracy. So, you know, clearly they were trying to avoid this. And if you saw them, uh, if you saw the arguments in court, which obviously I did, they were so uncomfortable. They were as uncomfortable as the man who came to meet me. He, they couldn't use the words. They couldn't use, they, they started giggling. It was like 60 year old men who were just giggling. And <laughs> it, it, was, it was a really, uh, it was uh, really sad to see, you know? I mean, it was uh, very sad to see. Uh, what is your comment on marital claim, no, marital uh, rape not being an offense with the recent judgment of the Supreme Court which says that uh, marital rape of women below 18 years is rape? Uh, how does that uh, I think marital rape should be a crime. I think, uh, I think rape is rape, whether it happens inside a marriage, outside a marriage. Um, I think it's astonishing actually to find how many countries do not consider it a crime. I'm, I'm actually, I did some research a year or so ago and I was shocked to see how many countries still consider it okay. They allow marital rape. Um, but you know, when we drafted the HIV law, uh, we had drafted a law for, on HIV which has become an act now uh, several years ago. One of the things we pushed was to make marital rape a crime through the law because you know, it's one of the points at which HIV spread is forced sex within marriages. 
it's the place, uh, it's a big uh, site for spread of dangerous, uh, uh, you know, uh, sexually transmitted infections generally. And we were told, it was really interesting, but this was 2005 or six. we were told as soon as uh, we presented it to the health ministry and the law ministry and we were told, they saw the clause on marital rape, they said your whole law will fall if you keep this. Parliament will never, never, never allow marital rape to be a crime. The first thing they will do is see that and they will, this is 2005. So obviously, I don't think things have changed very much. But it just shows how much uh, patriarchy kind of controls, uh, you know, these notions of what should be um, allowed and not allowed. And I think, uh, but my personal view is, of course, I mean, any rape is rape. There's no two ways about it. Okay, well, uh, this has been a wonderful evening and I'd like to thank Vivek once more and actually I would like to give him some flowers, which Thanks. I forgot to give earlier. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sunil. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. I, I went on for an hour. That's okay. We all enjoyed it. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank the Media Center for, uh, for videoing this event, and I'm told it will be on YouTube, so if your friends have missed it, they can go to the ICER YouTube channel. And last but not least, I would like to thank Shashidra, who had to leave for, for an urgent reason. But, you know, he pushed me a few months ago to give a talk in this room on right to privacy as an amateur. And that time I felt that we need somebody who knows what they're talking about. And I, my good friend was very kind to oblige. I think my father would have been proud of his talk. And so thank you once again. <laughs>